Quinn, a member of the California Arts Council and Beverly Hills Arts Commission, is the former West Coast editor of Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine and society editor of the Herald Examiner. Her cover stories can be read in Venice and Detour magazines, and she is a contributing editor to California Apparel News. For the next half hour, Joan will bring you inside news and views on society, art, film, and the exhilarating worlds of these multifaceted people. Here is Joan Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to Joan Quinn, etc. Visiting us on the set today is Katherine Kramer. Katherine was born in a trunk. Oh, no, 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 no. She was born on April 4th, 1969, to actress Karen Sharp and producer, director Stanley Kramer. She really did come from a show business background. She started auditioning for the theater at age 10. And in order to maintain a normal upbringing, I think her parents decided they better move away to Seattle. But once they got up there, nothing changed. Seattle's a big theater town, and Catherine fell for the theater, I think. She went to school and got straight A's, but all the time she was working in dramas and musicals. By the time she was 12, she won the Best Actress of the Season Award for her role in The Miracle Worker. So, Catherine, was going away worth it? <laughs> yes, definitely. I'm so glad that we, you know, that I wasn't raised here. Um, mainly because I think the theater community here, when I was really young, it was strong, but not, it didn't really have that Eastern feeling to it in terms of, you know, kids. I, I, I don't know if I would have had the same opportunities, and Seattle is, I guess, next to New York, it's got, like, the best theater in the country, so it was like a mecca of opportunity. Um, for a young actress to really get her feet wet and, and experience and also go to school at the same time. I think so. a young actress, not a young child, because I don't <laughs> think you ever had a childhood. <laughs> no, I just, I, I guess um, people have always asked me, you know, did growing up in the business influence your choice? And I'm sure that has something to do with it, but no, I've always just really wanted to do this with my life, to make this my profession. and. Um, I guess when I was like three years old, I, I was dancing, but I started listening to musicals, and and that was like a, a destiny for me, just a driving force, you know. I <laughs> but, but, but you weren't taking lessons at that time, were you? Just came yeah. naturally? Well, I think I started dancing, like tap and ballet, and when I was really young, but even probably before we moved away, and then singing and acting, training and, and going to school and working all at the same time by the time I was, I don't know, before junior high, I guess. So you were always working, it seems. Yeah. At, at 15, you were in New York studying with Berga That's right, and yeah. uh, Hagen. Right, yeah, that was a great experience. How did that, was that a summer time, or what um, was it? Yeah, I mean, it started as summer, and then I lived there for a while, but uh, Mr. Berghoff wanted me to move back then, and I said, no, school's real important, I've got to go back and finish it. So, you know, at this point, I don't know, I mean, I love New York, and I probably would have loved to have just moved moved then, but I went back to Seattle and finished schooling and then decided to come down here, you know, after that. But finishing schooling was just finishing high school, wasn't yeah. it? Right. <laughs> I, I almost, um, you know, I was accepted like at Juilliard and, and I had to make a choice. Did I want to do that or just continue pursuing um, singing and acting? Because I've always wanted to do both. And they kind of have a strict curriculum, at least at the time they did. You had to either do acting or singing. You know, you couldn't combine both things. So I just said, no, I, I think that I'll just go in and pursue them down in L.A., you know. <laughs> and then you so. started singing with big, you've sung with big yeah. bands as well? Um, what's really fascinating, <laughs> that's why, I mean, I, I've been a big band singer, and people look at me like, <laughs> how can you do that? But. Um, Seattle at that time when I was growing up there, I guess I started when I was about 12, they had all the great musicians that had played with like Count Basie and Harry James and all those people from the era, and they had like formed their own bands, and so I was their girl singer for, you know, all, as long as I can remember from like 12 till the time I moved away, singing in major events, and so I, I really think I know what it was like to have been a band singer during that time, because I've got that background. You know, I mean, I, I like different styles of music, but my roots are like that because that's what I was taught. Well, that's way back, too. <laughs> I think you lived that yeah. another life. <laughs> Maybe so, yeah. <laughs> um, we have a clip oh, great. of uh, you singing, 
It's not with a big band, but it's with a, a small combo. Right, yeah. It's at a uh, cabaret in yeah, Los Angeles. Yeah, this was Erica's um, at the Rose. At the Rose. A few, we'll, a few months ago. Yeah. We'll see it. Okay. Strong voice. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. That, you know, that was a great night. I really had fun because um, Jerry Herman was the guest at the show and he brought Jerome Lawrence and mm. they wrote MAME. I mean, uh, Jerry Herman is like my favorite all time Broadway composer, so it was just such a great experience having him. Was he a friend before? No, I didn't know him that well. That's why it was just so oh. exciting. I mean, I think I'd met him about a week before because I was meeting with him on something. And, oh. and then when I heard he was coming to the show, it wasn't my normal show that I normally do. I told everybody, I said, we have to do a tribute to him. And because I'd always wanted to do it. I've done like songs of his, but I'd never done like a full tribute. And I wanted to do like every song I knew of his. And he said, you have to, <laughs> you know, no, it has to be condensed into a certain amount of time. So we're going to see just a, a little bit of I that tribute. So, yeah, yeah like that'll the... be great. Okay, we'll watch a little bit of the tribute to Jerry Herman. Okay. Same <laughs> evening. Coming to be on the Broadway stage. I love the lights and the music. My hair was that color because I was um, working on a project, a tribute to Lucy, Lucy O'Ball. You know, I love Lucy. It was a music video I had and like wanting to be like the redhead of the 90s. And <laughs> so this is my natural color, but that was, you know. That like, was a great red color. Oh, Who else um, have you held up as a role model? There's, you know, Joan, there's been so many women um, actresses, singers in my life from when I was very young that I've idolized. I mean, Judy Garland was like a big role model of mine growing up and um, 
my godmother, Catherine Hepburn, is, you know, I, I was named after her, and she's like a big role model of mine, too. I think that's a great story, talking about Catherine, because uh, the beginning of your bio says, Catherine with an A, <laughs> and Catherine Hepburn tells you, you'll always be saying it's <laughs> with right. an A, but yeah. your name wasn't really going to be Catherine. No. Tell us what happened. I think that's a, a cute story. Um, when my parents, when I was um, born, they just made Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, I guess, a couple years before that. And Spencer Tracy told my dad, you know, you better name her Spencer if she's a boy. <laughs> and But I was a girl, so they named me Catherine after Catherine Hepburn, and she became my godmother. So I don't know what it would have been if I'd been Spencer, you know, that would have been, you know, or Catherine Spencer. You, <laughs> you Spencer. could have had a new stage yeah. name. You're, um, you were talking about, um, women in, in music, and I know you have a production company with yeah, your mother, Karen. Exactly, yeah. K and K. Yeah, right. Yeah. And um, you've been working on uh, some productions. There's um, a lot of projects I really believe in which focus on women's stories and women's issues, and um, the one right now that we're really working on is the Anita O'Day story, and that's I'm really excited about that one because to me, Anita is like the greatest, she is the greatest jazz song stylist in the world, but her story is like a Billie Holiday, only she survived the drugs and everything that happened to her in her life. So it's like Lady Sings the Blues, only with a lot of inspiration. So I am really have real high hopes for this. Would you actually be in the movie? Well, I'm hoping to portray the young Anita, um, who was a band singer, which is, <laughs> I guess, you know, that's why I gravitated towards it and then have a great actress, um, really dynamic person play the part from say like mid-30s till uh, now, because Anita's um, 73 years old, so it goes oh. up, you know, because she's still singing, I mean, better than ever. It's really exciting. I think it's just fabulous the way you've picked some of these people to <laughs> kind of intertwine <laughs> in your life. Um, what about Broadway? Um, Broadway's always been a real strong goal of mine. I mean, I hope to do like movies, records, television. I, I never really wanted to put a limit on what I did. And I think, um, unfortunately, a lot of people want to slot a performer like, you know, you sing this, this is what you should do. And I've always wanted to, you know, do all of it. And um, hopefully in my lifetime, that's what I'll have a chance to do. Well, we call you singer, dancer, actress, now producer. <laughs> <laughs> and then we hope to see you on Broadway. <laughs> thanks. I hope so. <laughs> Good. And thanks to Katherine Kramer. We'll be looking for her in the future. And we'll be right back on Joan Quinn, etc. Don't go away. Hello, we're back. I'm Joan Quinn, and we're talking to Jean-Pierre Dorliac. Jean-Pierre has worked as a costume designer for 30-something years. He won the Tony in 1966 for Merit Saad on Broadway, and in 1971 and 72, the dramas Merit Saad and A Doll's House were produced in Los Angeles. Jean-Pierre received the Los Angeles Drama Circle Critics Award for Distinguished Costuming, in each play. In 1979, there was an Emmy Award for Battlestar Galactica. And in 1990, 1991, and 1992, Emmy nominations for Quantum Leap. Are you still designing the costumes for Quantum Leap? I started the show from the very beginning, and I'm kind of still doing it. I'm sort of an, under a consultant's uh, situation right now because uh, I just signed to do a big picture at Universal for Ron Underwood who directed City Slickers. We're doing a wonderful old-fashioned, you won't believe it, movie called Heart and Souls. So can you do both? Can you do a movie and your I, TV? I could if I wanted to. I've done it in the past but this time I wanted to devote myself really very strongly to this film because it's one of the best films I've read in years. 
And so I found somebody else to take over. I think f after four years, I gave them practically everything I possibly could. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. I think you can still pull a little <laughs> bit out. <laughs> oh, it's a little difficult because after you've done it for such a long length of time, you find situations where the producer only likes certain colors or certain styles and so forth. And before you realize it, the series sort of becomes stylized. Uh, I was going to ask you if someone dictates colors or... Uh, oh, yeah. Yes, most definitely. Especially in Quantum Leap, we very, have very restrictive color rules because of all the blue screening we do. For example, Dean Stockwell, who's the hologram on the show, cannot wear blue in certain scenes because they blue screen him to be able to make him walk through buses or walls and so oh. forth. And as a result of it, uh, we're only able to use just specific certain colors for his clothes. Oh, well, that must be very interesting then and a, quite a challenge, more so than... Anything else? Yes. <laughs> we have a clip from Quantum right. Leap. It's one of my favorite episodes. It was called Sea Bride. I was nominated for the Emmy in 1991 uh, for this one. So let's take a look okay. at it. What the hell are you doing? There's a view. Everybody's watching. You look gorgeous. Smile. I don't want to smile. I need to talk to you. We have nothing to say to each other. Wow, the tango <laughs> with Scott Bakula. And Beverly Leach in the red dress that was in uh, Sax's window uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, they were, uh, the city of Beverly Hills was honoring the nominees for Emmy in series uh, for you, costume design. And they showed the clothes in the window. I was really thrilled. And Beverly went on to Broadway, didn't yeah, she? Yeah, she went on to do uh, Rage of uh, City of Angels on Broadway. That yeah. was so great, too. Yeah. It was perfect. Good actress. And she looked wonderful Thank you. in that. She looked, and that dress, it just moved so beautifully. And to feel like you had any constraints, I don't see any. <laughs> 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 you also um, won an Oscar, or you had an Oscar nomination? Oscar nomination. Oscar, Oscar nomination for Somewhere in Time, which was a film. Um, but it seems to have a life of its own. When was it first? Uh, it was made? released in, uh, in 1980 uh, to terrible reviews. Uh, and it was in the theater for like two weeks, terrible promotion on it. And we thought it was a dead issue. Uh, all of a sudden, out of the last 10 years, there's this huge cult following. Uh, it's, uh, there's a group called the uh, International Network of Somewhere in Time Enthusiasts, <laughs> and there's, there's over 10,000 people. <laughs> they just had um, a reunion recently at Mackinac Island at the Grand Hotel where they filmed it at that I went to, and there was 800 people there in turn-of-the-century costumes who came as far away from England and France to come to this. There's a great love of this film. It's just unbelievable. Isn't that s surprising to yeah. you? It, it, we really never ever thought this would happen. Who goes from the film? Who, who goes to the reunion? Oh, when I was there, there was Susan French who played Jane Seymour when she was older, and uh, Bill Irwin, who the actor actor who played Arthur, the uh, bellhop in the film, and Janot Schwark, who was the director, and Marianne Biddle, who was the art director, and myself. And the year previously, I don't know because I was involved in something else, but this was the only second reunion they've had on it. Oh, so you, that, this could yeah. be something that'll go on They're forever. They're planning another one next year. <laughs> I think it's great. And do they try to copy the costumes that you did? They have a, they had a costume contest, and uh, part of the costume contest was somewhere in time look-alike costumes. <laughs> and sure enough, about eight women tried to copy the dresses from the Is film. Right? Quite flattering, really. <laughs> That's really great. You did bring us a clip of yes. that, too. So let's look at that, because I think it'd be interesting This to is see. the dining room in the film that's still in existence. It's as long as a football field. So you were just there the other day? Yeah, it's unbelievable. Okay, we'll see somewhere in time. Uh, 
Sounds a bit corny to say it was so beautiful, but it was so beautiful. <laughs> you must have had a great time. Oh, I had a wonderful time, both on the film and back there for the reunion. Did you do the hats? The hats were sensational. It's sort of a, a sin to admit, I think, but I was very, very, really particular about the hats in the film, and I sat and did every hat individually. Uh, Jeannot, the director, wanted a very death and Venice look, uh, uh, excess within control, and that's what we were hoping for. That's what it looked like. I mean, it was just so exciting. <laughs> it was so great. Uh, how did you get into costuming? Oh, my family's been in the theater business for years and years and years, and I started out as a child actor. And I was an actor until, oh, the mm, late 60s, early 70s, and uh, I was doing a play, Oh, Dad, Poor Dad, and the costume designer got ill, and I asked if I couldn't do it because it was quite flamboyant. Madame Rose Petal's clothes were just three much, as the old expression goes. And um, one thing led to another. I got better reviews for costume designing than I did for acting, and I changed over and, uh, and have never regretted it. You can't put me in front of a camera except like this. Oh, that was anymore. great. <laughs> did you? <laughs> that was re really, um, was it here? Did you no, do no, that no, here? I did that in Europe, yeah, so when I was in Paris. That was is back. that where your family is? I from? was born in the south of France, in Toulon, and raised all over the world. My father was in the Air Force. So I, was, I studied in uh, Portugal, Japan, uh, here in the United States, oh. back in France. I see, I see. Was there someone, once you got into costuming, that you uh, looked at as an idol or a hero? When I came to Los Angeles, um, I was introduced to Edith Head, and Edith uh, was wonderful, <clears throat> uh, just absolutely wonderful to me. Uh, she helped me out in all kinds of ways. I was doing a production called The Bastard, the John Jake's Bicentennial uh, at Universal, and Anne Francis was in it. And one day I was designing this big Polonaise 1770s dress, and Edith saw it, and the next day she came back and she brought me an original ivory hand painted fan of the period to go with it, and asked me, she said, I don't want to step in and intrude, but I'd like you to have, and I was just really flattered by it. She was a wonderful, wonderful she lady. She was, and it sounds like besides being so wonderful and friendly, she was very giving in her very own generous, field. Very generous, yes, very, very generous. When, when you make the costumes for a um, movie or a TV, do you make them right on the lot? Are there places yes. to make them there? Yes, we have a costume shop at Universal, at other studios, and there's private costume shops here in town where there's cutter fitters, that's for ladies, and tailors for the men, and uh, a whole slew of seamstresses. At Universal, where I'm working now, there's like about 12 seamstresses and about 10 tailors, in addition to the head tailor. And, and then we have people who make the shoes elsewhere, and hats somewhere else, and jewelry somewhere else, and shirts somewhere else. You make all those we things? We make everything, everything. Do you, well, then they must be made to last. I was wondering if yes. there was if it was for a facade. No, 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 with no. Cheap the clothes fabric. are made. No, the clothes for costumes are very well made. They're made better than street clothes, really, because they have to last a long time. Sometimes you get a film in which the actor only wears one costume through the entire film, oh. like Christopher Reeve in Somewhere in Time. And we made six suits identically because so he could keep changing off and have a fresh one every day of the week. Would you ever go out and buy something off the rack? Me personally? Oh, no, I mean, well, for your show. Or for oh, I've done like a that. lot of shows in which I uh, 
purchase for the show. But it's not as challenging, it's not as rewarding as uh, being actually a designer from the ground up. Where do you think um, you'll go from costuming? Or are you going to stay there? I have no desire to go anywhere else. <laughs> oh, I love good. what I'm doing very much. <laughs> That's really good. Um, one thing, just before we leave, I know you've participated in a lot of uh, museum shows where your work has been put on um, view in an exhibition. Right. Uh, the Los Angeles County Museum did a, a retrospective of Hollywood costumes uh, several years ago called Hollywood in History that Edward Mader put together. It was a wonderful exhibit. I recently had my thing shown in Paris at La Place Vendôme, uh, the Parisians, uh, Banque Francais did um, a whole uh, showing of my work, which I was completely flabbergasted about because I didn't even know I was that well known back in Europe. And then who owns those? Does the studio still own those things and then they loan them to exhibitions? Uh, no, I had a contract put in my contract, uh, a clause put in my contract years ago that after film was over with that I got five of the original costumes from the show for that very reason, because Edith told me that if you don't take care of them, nobody else will. And they have a tendency to disappear or be reworked and something added on to them or something taken off and used on another film later on. So they're never the same if you leave them in stock. Oh, that's really interesting, and that's very smart. And with that note, we're going to leave. <laughs> we're going to disappear. And we thank Jean-Pierre Dorliac for being with us, and thank you for watching us. See you next time on Joan Quinn, etc.